want to ask you two questions. What would we find if we looked into all your bank statements and transaction history? What power would that grant the entity looking into it? Today, I will tell you the story of her long lost friend, Privacy, and how Privacy met its guardian angel. Let's start right here in the present. I'm a millennial, and like most millennials, I barely use cash. However, this is not the case for everyone. Cash is still dominant around the globe. But there is a problem with cash. Did you know that, that it costs 0.5% of a country's GDP to print, transport, and store money? Cash is expensive. Let's take Switzerland as an example. In 2009, the GDP was 703 billion. And if we take half percent of that, we come to the amount of 3.5 billion. To put things into perspective, this is as much as India's entire government spending on healthcare for one year. There are other problems with cash. People don't want to handle money. We don't want to go to the ATMs. We just want to tap, pay, and go. During the pandemic, digital capabilities have accelerated by at least five years five years. We are witnessing a surge in digital payments around the globe. Paying digitally may be convenient on one hand, may be cheap and sanitary, but it comes with a major downside. It makes us traceable. It exposes us and it allows entities to monitor us at all times. Your data can be centrally stored, analyzed, and sold to third parties, and also sell it so that people or entities profit from it. Importantly, this data can be used to influence your decisions and shape your behavior. By aggregating all this information, someone could potentially apply smarter and smarter analytics and use this information to influence, monetize, and manipulate the predictability of our behavior. And yes, countless writers, economists, and technologists have longed for a cashless world, but they overlook the important effect this can have on privacy. In the global age, in the global world, we tend to underestimate the importance of privacy. I mean, you remember when was the last time you read the terms and conditions before using a new online tool? Do you even know how your data is used and by whom? We constantly feed our governments and corporations with our location data or social media accounts and also our transaction history for free, even though they are monetizing it tremendously. Privacy is a fundamental human right, and we take it for granted. But here is what happens if you live in a system which violates your privacy. You may have heard of the social credit scoring, the social credit system in China, which is today implemented and practiced. I want us to take the real example of a journalist who works out of Shanghai, and we will call her Jane Doe in order to protect her privacy. Jane writes about government corruption and censorship, and because of, line, because of her line of work, she has been fined, arrested, and blacklisted. Her name can be found on the list of the dishonest people subject to enforcement by the People's Court of China and denied access from buying a plane ticket, not only an international one, a domestic one as well, buying a property, and also taking out a loan. Imagine if this happened to you. If all of a sudden you would be, not, you would be denied access to essential services. Currently, with money going towards purely digital, the restrictions one can impose on a person's ability to participate in society are broad. 
And yes, we can think about it. How could they not be concerned about the implementation of the digital yuan, which is issued by the People's Bank of China? What powers do what governments gain with your centralized financial data? Currently, we are going down the spectrum of full digitalization of our payments in a very centralized way. And yes, we can all imagine how easy it would be or how convenient it would be walking down the Thames in London by the South Bank and tipping the sidewalk performers with our smartwatch because they are playing fantastic music, so they, they deserve the tip. Or when I'm in gelato, or not in gelato, but in Rome, and they want to pay for my gelato uh, in Piazza Novona with the scan of my face, I could do that only if not wearing a mask. And this sounds like such a convenient digital world, but at what cost? Soon, every transaction we make can be traced. The Googles, the Facebooks, and the Microsofts, and the credit card companies of the world have been making it easy for decades to pay by card because it's quick and convenient, and with that, they know what and where exactly we shop. Our banks are profiling and selling our data to third parties, and those third parties know what we usually have for breakfast, what newspapers we read, and eventually where we travel complementing all this with tracking our cell phone in our pocket, they can virtually and literally store our entire lives minute by minute, transaction by transaction. With the help of algorithms, or next purchase, or totes, or needs, or behavior are all predictable. Do you remember Minority Report? For those of you who have not seen this movie, basically the government and authorities can pre predict and prevent crime before it happens. This is fantastic until the system may turn against you. Would you like to live in such an experimental, brave new world if entities and authorities can know our past, our present, and our future? What happens to our freedom? What happens to our free will? Let's rewind. So what are really our options? If we want to fully preserve our privacy, we can use cash. But let's be realistic, cash is not the future. We can use digital payment, as in we can pay by cards, but then we sacrifice our privacy, thankfully. When it comes to money, those are not our only options. We have a guardian angel, if you will. We have Bitcoin. Yes, the magical internet money, which is on one hand a digital currency, a cryptocurrency, which can be used globally, and it's also a payment system through which you can transact in a way not exposing your entire transaction data. Think about it this way. Bitcoin is here to democratize finance just as the internet democratized content, and with it, opportunity. And the flattering, flattering fact is that there is no third party behind Bitcoin hoarding your data. So let me highlight three aspects of Bitcoin which help to use it in a way which doesn't, doesn't it's not subject to certain auto approvals and authorizations you need to have. And the first point is that Bitcoin is peer-to-peer -peer, and I would like to bring back Jane Doe. So this means that Jane can transact in a way not relying on the approval of a third party of a bank or, um, or uh, of a government. So Jane can transact without the approval of everyone. This also means that Bitcoin is censorship resistant. Bitcoin is permissionless meaning that Jane can participate in the governance of the network without the approval of everyone again or anyone, and she can build products and services on the top if she has affinity to do that. I could see all the transactions of Jane on the network 
but I could not link the specific transactions to her person. I have a confession to make. Like many of you and many in my community, first was interested in the high return potential of Bitcoin and looked at it as an investment. But later, I learned about the idea of a finite asset and I learned about the notion of empowering the individual and also about the mindset of Bitcoin. Bitcoin cannot be controlled by a central entity. I found myself working with the world's smartest people and I went from thinking that Bitcoin is gold for nerds to realizing that Bitcoin is digital gold for everyone. So how can we use Bitcoin to protect our long lost friend privacy? The path to privacy may be bumpy, but if we focus on education, because we get there, because <laughs> there are not enough university courses, there are not enough non-technical explainers, and there are not enough TED Talks like this today. I was about to say that there are not enough Bitcoins, which is true because there are never enough Bitcoins since it's a finite asset. Only 21 million are ever going to be in supply. The second point is usability. Basically, we have to create and build products which are easy to use. Currently, we already have a have come a long way. You can spend your bitcoins by cards already and also contact like contactless payments and this fosters convenience. Not just that it fosters convenience but closes the gap between bitcoin and the digital payment system, the current digital payment system. And it's even better because it protects your privacy. It protects our privacy. The third point is awareness. Awareness of how your data is used. Because we shall not forget that in the digital age, the most important asset is data. We have to encourage people to learn how their privacy may be violated or how their data is exposed and help them understand that they should not compromise on their privacy. This is what our community is doing. We are trying to build in different layers into the network with the aim to protect your fundamental right to privacy because that is the foundation of a free society. Let's reset. Let's imagine a future where privacy and progress go hand in hand. A future where we can opt for better alternatives where we can use technology in a way allowing more privacy, more agency, and more transparency for all. Personally, I would love to celebrate every year the launch of the Bitcoin network, which happened in 2009, 3rd of January. Imagine grow this into a global holiday. And uh, part of my community is already celebrating this and they are marking it as the start of the global modern freedom. Imagine having the choice of how much of your data is being exposed and disclosed when shopping online. Similar to cash, when you're paying with Bitcoin, you don't need to reveal your identity. It's important that it's enough and important that the merchant knows that you paid. In case of a bigger transaction, like buying a flight ticket or buying a Tesla, buying a new home, you would still need to identify yourself, but most transactions wouldn't get uploaded into a centralized database. Also, you could pay your taxes and loans in Bitcoin, which is already possible today in the little town called Zug in the heart of the Crypto Valley here in Switzerland. The metaphoric name, the guardian angel of privacy, I dare to call Bitcoin, comes from the fact that this invention truly has the power to safeguard your privacy and mine. I started with two questions. I would like to finish it, close it with two questions as well. What rights and privileges do you have to lose in order to start using Bitcoin? How much is your privacy worth? Thank you.